Okay, so this is lecture 16 and uh, today I'll be discussing the path integral for fermionic fields. Last uh, time we talked about the path integral for bosonic field theory and uh, there was one thing which made our job quite easy in the case of bosonic field theory, uh, scalar field theory, which is that we already knew how to do the path integral over some coordinates of a particle in quantum mechanics and we simply translated that knowledge into the path integral over uh, scalar fields. Now unfortunately or fortunately every time we have a new type of field in field theory uh, the translation of that knowledge it doesn't work so simply. In principle whatever we did for the scalar field we could try to apply to a vector field but for a vector field, as you know, uh, it typically has gauge invariance and then the path integral becomes more interesting and complicated. And so that we'll do a few lectures from now. Uh, so it's not that trivial to go from scalars to vectors when it comes to path integrals. But the, the entire reason is due to gauge invariance. On the other hand, uh, we may try to go to fermions. And here we have a different problem which is that we didn't get used to integrating over fermions. You have to learn a little bit about how to integrate over fermions. Uh, the reason is that fermions we already argued long ago uh, are represented by anti-commuting anti numbers, which are very strange kind of numbers. And integrating over anti-commuting numbers is something which presumably you haven't done before. And in fact, most people in the field theory community also hadn't done pretty much up to the 1970s. So these things became, although the mathematics was there, people had not really tried to integrate over anti-commuting variables in the path integral. And uh, it took a while. So there are actually three steps we have to do. So that our goal today is integrating So in pre I mean I mean the path integral over fermion fields because after all if we are going to use path integral as our method of quantization then since models of nature like the standard model contain fermionic fields, Dirac fields, then we have to integrate over them somehow. But this has three steps. First, ordinary integration over anti-commuting numbers. This already contains quite a few cool surprises. Then path integration <coughs> over so uh, anti-commuting uh, functions so what do I mean by this instead of going from this ordinary integration directly to path integration over field psi of x and t, we'll have to learn uh, how to deal with such fields uh, without uh, allowing for dependence on x, which simplifies the problem. So this is like a toy intermediate problem between integrating over just numbers and integrating over full fields of t and x. So stage three, which actually will turn out more or less trivial. <coughs> Once we do stages one or two, one and two, we'll be integrating over field psi of t and x. So this middle stage, uh, we call this sometimes ultra local limit. So what we do is we take a field and we just pretend that it doesn't depend on x. We just take it to not depend on x. 
So lots of things get simplified. Of course, then we don't also integrate in d3x because otherwise we'll just get infinity for no reason. Uh, in fact, the ultra local limit of the scalar field phi of tnx is something which we can call phi of t, but really it's the same object with which we were doing quantum mechanics. In quantum mechanics, we learned how to path integrate over functions x of t. Instead of x, if I call it phi, then there are functions phi of t. Nothing changes if I change the name of x. Okay, so those, so the x experience we gained by doing path integral in quantum mechanics was used uh, in this step when it came to doing the path integral over bosonic field. So we only had to go from here to here. Well, fortunately, step one was already done by you all in school when you learnt integration for the first time. Hmm. So here we have to do step one afresh for anti-commuting numbers and then we invent this step two also for anti-commuting functions and then we get to step three. Is it clear? Yes. Because the anti-commuting function can depend upon anti-commuting number? No, it depends on commuting number t because that number should be time. The number should be time and space. There are still fields in space time, ordinary space time. Now, if you had asked this question in 1970s, you would have become very famous because people asked that question, what if we consider fields which depend on anti-commuting numbers? And that leads to a very interesting development called superspace, where the fields depend on space time as well as anti-commuting numbers. And this superspace was developed by, I think, two groups, one of which was Abdus Salam in uh, ICTP, Salam and Strathdee, and another group, I think, was Wes and Zumino. Uh, and uh, it was done in the context of supersymmetry, where it's supersymmetric field theory, where it's actually very useful, I think. But since we are not going to really do supersymmetric field theory in this course, we won't uh, use that idea, but it's a nice idea, and one could think of it. And it turned out actually quite fruitful. But this will be hard enough, so we are going to focus all our energy on this. Okay. <coughs> Good. So, the first question is, let's start with the variable theta, which is anti-commuting. What's the most general function of theta? Well, the first thing is if it's anti-commuting, then theta squared is zero. That's what anti-commuting implies. But in that case, the most general function of theta I can possibly have is f0 plus f1 times theta, where f0 and f1 are ordinary numbers. Because basically, I expand it around theta equals 0. It's like a Taylor expansion. At theta equals 0, whatever I get, I'll call it F0. Then there's a linear term. Whatever multiplies it, I'll call it F1. But there's no quadratic term because of this relation. And all higher terms go to 0. So this is very nice. Taylor expansion of anti-commuting fun uh, functions of anti-commuting numbers, much simpler than Taylor expansion of functions of commuting numbers. We don't have to worry about radius of convergence or anything. There are just a couple of terms. Okay. Now it can get more complicated if I start with many different independent anti-commuting numbers like theta 1, theta 2, theta 3. Then this expansion can, can go longer and we'll do that. But it always terminates. So that's one of the great things. Um, just as an don't take this too directly, but just as an intuitive fact, this reminds us of the fact that a fermion can really have only, uh, a, a, let's say, a spin half. Well, sorry, a fermion, a fermionic particle can either occupy a state or leave the state unoccupied, but it can't occupy the same state state twice. Exclusion principle. Okay, so this is somehow some classical mathematical embodiment of exclusion principle and we see it in the fact that there are no terms with theta squared or higher powers of theta and actually it will turn into exclusion principle when we finally reach step three the fields but it's a it's a cute fact and uh, because of this reason as i'm sure you know in a many body system 
uh, you can have both condensation because you can have lots of bosons filling up all the states and then at low temperature they can all fall into the ground state. But with fermions you don't have that because even at zero temperature fermions have to pile up uh, at the, because each one, each state can only be filled by a maximum of one fermion. If, they, if it has a spin then two states of that but so it's very different. And I'm, I'm sure you also know that the physics of fermion, fermionic and bosonic particles is generally very different. Um, always it's the exclusion principle. So it's no surprise that the maths will also be somewhat different. Okay. Now once we got the Taylor expansion of a function of a single variable, the next step is to ask ourselves what is the integral of such a function over d theta. And our job is to invent this integral using some consistency rules. But the nice thing is an integral as you know is a linear function. So whatever it is, this should be the same as f0 times integral of 1 plus f1 times integral of, sorry, 1 means integral of d theta times plus this. I have just inserted the Taylor expansion in here and used linearity. So that means that if I give you, if we know two integrals, integral d theta of nothing, I mean of 1, and integral d theta of theta, then we know everything. So all integration over anti-commuting numbers is de determined once we know how to integrate 1 and theta. Now you can ask is this a definite or indefinite integral. So an inde a definite integral has limits. Okay? But the limits would again be anti-commuting numbers and we don't really know any constant anti-commuting numbers. You can just give them names like theta 0 and theta 1 but it's not very interesting. So it turns out that the only integrals we are going to discuss in the anti-commuting case are the, um, the well, I don't know if I should call it definite or indefinite, is the analog of integral dx from minus to plus infinity. Okay, So it's a definite integral, but we don't specify the limits. There's no constant of integration. Okay, There's just one answer. We never ask what is the integral over, there's an, it's over if you like the full anti-commuting space, whatever it might be. So you should think of it that way. Okay, so now let's give names to these answers. This is, let's call it A, Sir? and yes, one second, and let's call this B. Yes. So all of the analysis that we do with ah. numbers, that is like derivable from the fact that number, like real numbers are a field. Yes. And there the essential part is commutativity of the yes. uh, multiplication. Yes. But here we don't have that. We have anti-commutativity of multiplication. So how do you know that all of our uh, all of the analysis rules that we have. We are not going to use the analysis rules that we have. We are inventing new ones. Differentiation and integration will be different from the usual rules. But like we are writing it out as a power series, right? Like we are invoking some. Yeah. Like so we are going to assume some basic properties. Simply that. I mean, you know, you can call this a power series or you can simply say, look, if theta squared is 0, so we will we, we'll allow theta to be multiplied by an ordinary number. That's the first step. I didn't write it. I can't, I don't have time to write all the axioms. But we can say that if theta is an, ax, uh, an anti-commuting number, then 7 times theta or pi times theta or 55 times theta is also an anti-commuting number. We'll just allow the prefactor to be a general real or complex number. So let's allow that. Okay, we'll just add that to our space. Given that theta is in our space, then any z times theta, where z is any complex number, we'll let it be in our space. Okay, now we'll ask what is the general function of theta. And well, you can either have a function, an ordinary number, or you can have an ordinary number multiplying theta, and you can't have anything else. So we just write the general function as the sum of this. We can keep track of a few things. Uh, in this line, for example, 
the commuting or anti-commuting nature must be respected. And so we have essentially two choices. We can either say f of theta, f itself is, takes values in the space of commuting numbers, then f0 is an ordinary number, okay? While f1 is an anti-commuting number, so that when it multiplies theta, the result will be commuting, okay? And there's always this concept of grading, uh, mathematically speaking, which says that a single anti-commuting number, you can uh, you imagine giving it a minus sign in your mind, and two of them have a plus sign. So the minus sign, when it any number has a minus sign, we call it odd, and we say that it anti-commutes. When it has a plus sign, we call it even, and we say it commutes. So it's just basic, basic things we assume. So these, many of these things were done by Grassmann and later by Berezin. So this is integration is due to Berezin. So as I said, I'm cutting the story short and just showing you some reasonable assumptions under which we can fix everything. And here, the assumptions are that integral d theta is some number a and d theta times theta is b. And now you can see that a must be an anti-commuting number while b must be a commuting number by this grading argument, okay? Now, as I said, there's really no constant anti-commuting number that we can identify readily. So the most natural, and as it turns out correct for path integral, most natural choice, uh, so since there is no standard anti-commuting number, what do I mean by standard? Well, for example, when it comes to real numbers, we can choose one as a standard number because it's the identity of the multiplicative group or zero as a standard number because it's identity under addition. But there's, this, this doesn't really have any of those properties, doesn't form a group under multiplication because things can square to zero. So there's no standard number. So we simply uh, choose integral d theta equals zero. So the integral over all of anti-commuting space is set by hand to zero. On the other hand, integral d theta theta is a commuting number and there is a standard commuting number. Uh, we could either choose it maybe zero or one, but zero would be a very boring choice because then all integrals would be zero and we're never going to find a path integral or any integral indeed. There'll be nothing left to do. So we might as well choose it non-zero, in which case we can choose it to be one, because if it's not one, we can scale theta and d theta and make it one. So we'll just assume that it's one. So these are all the rules. Unlike ordinary Riemann integration, where you have to learn pages and pages of formula, how to integrate tan and tan inverse and one over square root and this and that, every integral in anti-commuting numbers has to be one of these. So if I have multiple anti, so now for example, I can use this to evaluate integral d theta f of theta, where f is this function. So when I put this term in, I get zero. When I put this term in, I have to be a little careful. So this is equal to d theta f0 plus f1 theta. And the first term is zero because f0 is an ordinary number and so d theta is just integrated over all of space and gives zero. But the other term, I have integral d theta times f1 times theta. This is anti-commuting, this is anti-commuting, this is anti-commuting, okay? So at this point, if I want to use this second rule, I have to first bring f1 out. It's just a number, it doesn't participate in this integration. But to come out, it has to pass through d theta, which gives me a minus sign. So the answer is minus f1. Okay. F1 is a normal number. Yes, <clears throat> it's a normal, uh, it's not a, no a normal number. It's okay, so good. So uh, the idea is that, um, hmm. Uh, no, f1 is not a normal number, it's an anti-commuting number, okay? Now you could say that how can it be an anti-commuting number uh, if everything depends only on theta, then it can't depend on theta because it's by definition independent of theta, 
we are writing the theta dependence of this. So what you could imagine is that there are other thetas, like this is some theta 1 and there are other thetas and it might depend on those. So it can be anti-commuting but not in this theta, or not in the space of this theta. So in that case, but it's anti-commuting because only then the product will be commuting and then f is a commuting function. So f theta is a normal number. F theta is a normal number. What is a normal number? Yes. F theta is a normal yes, number. Exactly. Yeah. Like yes, exactly. Yes, yes, yes. Now, of course, there's a there's a still a subtlety. When you say F F1 theta is a normal number, there's a little bit of uh, non-normality about it. So it, it's normal in the sense that it commutes with any other number, including with numbers like itself, but it still squares to zero. So it F1 can't be F1? F1 theta. But F1 we said was supposed to be a anti-commuting anti number. number. Yes. But if I square F1 times theta, hmm. then I get minus of F1 squared times theta squared and theta squared is zero. Hmm. So this so even though it's a it's normal in the sense of commuting, it's um, it still squares to zero. Wait, so wait, yeah. F1 doesn't F1 doesn't commute, right? No, no, I know F1 does F1 doesn't it, it anti-commutes, right? Ah. It's an anti-commuting number. Ah, so it should square to zero, right? Yes, yes. But I'm saying the number F1 theta, you called it a normal number. Oh, right, right. This okay. number squares to zero also. Ah. Okay. Because this is equal to F1 theta, F1 theta, that's equal to minus F1 squared theta squared, bringing this F1 past this theta. But theta squared is already given to be zero. So this is zero. So among what you call normal numbers, which are better called commuting numbers, there will be some which are normal numbers, literally normal in the sense like two or pi or real numbers, complex numbers, but we'll allow ourselves to add these kind of numbers to it also. So it's a, it's yes, yes. So I think there should be a minus sign over there. Yes, maybe there is, I think there is, yes. Thank you, that's correct. Exactly right. Good. Now, uh, we can easily use all this to consider complex anti-commuting numbers by simply writing theta complex. I don't want to introduce a new notation for it. I'll just write it as theta 1 plus i theta 2. So in my space now, there are, it's a two-dimensional space, just like x and y where there are two anti-commuting numbers, theta 1 and theta 2, and I just make theta as this, and then the complex conjugate, which I'll write diagonal, is theta 1 minus i theta 2. So I treat theta 1 and theta 2 as real anti-commuting numbers, and the complex combination is that. Okay. <clears throat> now, um, now the integration, for example, measure, will be d theta, okay. So now uh, the problem is we would like d theta d theta to still be one and that won't work with this uh, definition. So probably I should have some half or one by root two or something. Um, Yeah, actually, let's not go into complex right now because there's some normalization issues which I'm not completely sure of. But instead, I want to point out one interesting thing. Supposing we go back to our real theta and we recall that integral d theta, theta is equal to 1. Now, let's suppose we change variables. Theta prime is equal to alpha times theta, where alpha is just a real number. Okay. What is d theta prime? Now, you would think that by some kind of linearity, it should be alpha d theta prime. But now we have a problem, because in that case, integral d theta prime theta prime can no longer be 1. It will be alpha squared. That's not supposed to happen. Any theta is supposed to satisfy d theta theta equals 1. So therefore, actually, d theta prime satisfies an inverse rule from theta prime, namely that it is 1 by alpha times theta. Uh, d theta. 
and this preserves this implies that the integral be theta prime theta prime equals 1. Now I know that you are seeing this as a set of very formal mani mathematical manipulations but I can assure you that in the last 50 years since this stuff really started to take off people have realized that first of all this is all actually true and secondly it all gives us exactly correct results about fermions in nature so you have to tolerate it for a while until you see how it actually works so people who work with the standard model anyone who does an actual honest calculation with the standard model starting with the path integral uh, which we are about to sort of formulate uses everything like everything that i've said and it's all correct hmm? it's just different because fermions are different from bosons just a fact so all the kind of key features of fermions are embodied in this anti-commuting nature and we'll see that it keeps giving <coughs> results which are subtly different from those we expected in ordinary analysis but we'll also see eventually that the, those results keep turning out to be correct so it's a it's a very good actually i must say that the physics community was fairly hostile to this whole formal stuff until they found that they need it this is also how research always works in the beginning people don't like new formalism until they find that it's actually making their lives easier then they get used to it okay so <clears throat> um yeah i wanted to write the complex case mm. I think um, I think we can. Yeah, I, I maybe I shouldn't do it today. The point is that in the complex case, we'll have theta equals theta one plus i theta two, and then we have to define the measure d theta suitably so that d theta theta is still one. That's all we have to do. I'm pretty sure we can do that. Let's try. So theta, I'm just going to take theta 1 plus i theta 2 for now. So d theta should be something such that d theta theta is still 1, though theta is complex. Sir, yes. I just to confirm theta 1, theta 2 are also uh, anti-commuting numbers. Yes, and they are real. I take theta 1 and theta 2 to be real. That means theta 1 dagger is theta 1, theta 2 dagger is theta 2. But theta dagger is not theta. Hmm? So theta 1 dagger equals theta 1, theta 2 dagger equals theta 2, and theta dagger is not the same as theta because there's a minus sign changed here. So they can, can't be the same. Okay. So for this to be 1, so this is theta 1 plus i theta 2. Then this must be d theta 1 plus, uh, so I'm, uh, I've got something d theta 2. And that something, I believe, oh, sorry, so it, it will be, you're allowed, okay, let me just give you the conclusion. I think this is half d theta 1 minus i d theta 2. This, to satisfy that, because now d theta 1, theta 1, gives me 1 times half, this with this gives me 1, minus i times i gives me 1, and I can get half, and d theta 1, theta 2, that's 0, because if I integrate d theta 1, something that doesn't depend on theta 1, then it vanishes. So this is correct. So this determines that the measure for a complex fermion is half d theta 1 minus i d theta 2. <coughs> And now we can do things like have a function which depends on both theta and theta bar, theta dagger. Okay, what can we say about such a function? Well, we can say that its scalar expansion is F0 
plus f1 theta plus f2 f2 theta dagger plus f3 theta dagger theta. So this is an example where the Taylor expansion became longer uh, because I have two independent because I have a complex variable so I can make this is non theta of course theta dagger both are allowed and theta dagger theta is not zero anymore because theta dagger theta is theta one minus i theta two let's work it out theta dagger theta is theta one minus i third theta two theta one plus i theta two now for ordinary numbers the cross term would cancel and we would have this squared plus this squared for anti-commuting numbers it's exactly the opposite theta 1 squared is 0, theta 2 squared is 0. What about the cross terms? One cross term is i theta 1 theta 2 from this and that. The other cross term is minus i theta 2 theta 1. And these two don't cancel because of the anti-commuting between the thetas. So remember, even if they are independent anti-commuting numbers, they must anti-commute with each other. And so this is actually twice i theta 1, theta 2. Now you could ask yourself, isn't this odd because theta dagger theta should be real from our understanding that any complex number z satisfies z dagger z is a real number. So is this real? Yes or no? No. Anyone says yes? It is real. It's not zero. Why should it be 0? Two different thetas and multiplied with each other aren't 0. Each one squared is 0. Okay. And I use the fact that theta 2, theta 1 is minus of theta 1, theta 2 to add this to this and get twice. Well, to check whether it's real, just take its dagger. Now, this is why I called it dagger and not star. For dagger, we use the rule that we always use for non-commuting objects, that objects which don't commute in general, which is anything, anytime you see i, you must replace by minus i, and any objects inside must be multiplied, in, must be daggered and multiplied in the reverse order, which is how we take dagger for product or matrices. So it is minus 2i theta 2 theta 1. In principle, this should have a dagger, this should have a dagger, but these are real. And now this is equal to 2i theta 1 theta 2. So we've just shown that with the dagger type of conjugation, 2i theta 1 theta 2 is real. So theta dagger theta is real. Okay. So like that. And so if, uh, so if f is real, then f0 has to be real, f3 has to be real. And f1 and f2 are complex conjugates of each other, possibly with some minus sign. So this is how Taylor expansions work with more than one variable. And now we can go to the most general case. Sir. Yes. I, I can anti-commute with theta 1? No. I commutes with everybody. I is an ordinary number. It's a commuting number. Ordinary numbers are allowed to be multiplied by anti-commuting numbers. <coughs> so I can be written on any side of theta and it's the same. The minus came because I put the dagger and dagger includes complex conjugation. So remember, what does dagger do in a matrix? It gives you complex conjugation and transpose. And because of that, it multiplies the, if I have A times B, its dagger is B dagger times A dagger. I reverse the order. I'll apply, I apply the same rule to, to these odd uh, anti-commuting numbers. And with that rule, I find that this quantity uh, is Hermitian or real, whatever you want to call it. Sir? Yes. Uh, the, the B of theta hmm. uh, had a net negative sign like it was B theta or minus I B theta two. Yeah. Right. Two. Yeah. So here, uh, like if we consider the differential as like some sort, like if we consider its relation to differentiation, ah. are we foregoing uh, linearity of the? Derivative? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, there is certainly something we are foregoing um, and actually what we will see uh, in a short uh, while is that differentiation and integration are the same as each other. Actually we have sort of seen that. Um, okay, Let, let's do that and then we will see what we are, whether we are foregoing something. Um, so let's, since you asked the question, let's recall 
that with a single variable f of theta was f0 plus f1 times theta. And we learned that integral of d, d theta f of theta is minus f1, right? This we fixed by our Grassmann integration rules. Now what is the derivative d by d theta of f of theta? Well, since there is only one variable, the natural thing is that d by d theta looks for any theta dependence and removes it. There can't even be a second power of theta, so either theta is there or not there. If it's not there, it gives zero, and if it's there, it removes it. So d by d theta on this is d by d theta on f0 plus f1 theta. So of course, this term doesn't give anything. And this term, d by d theta has to first reach here. To reach there, it has to go past f1 and get a minus sign. So it's minus f1. It's exactly the same rules as that. So integration is actually the same as differentiation. That's one observation. Secondly, I think actually that um, uh, this d theta 1 minus d theta 2 uh, has to do with something a little different, which is the... Um, or ordering, it's just the minus sign comes because of the reordering of 2 theta. So let, let me try to show you that and then we'll come back to your question. So the yeah. minus sign like also can, we, we can see it from that rule, like uh, theta, if theta dash is alpha theta, yes. d theta dash is 1 by alpha. Yes, that's correct. So 1 by i is minus i. That is also true. Yes, maybe that's so also a correct, that's a correct way I think to see it, yes, yes, yes. That's correct. I, I think that's actually the correct answer to your question. Yes, I didn't think of but it. In d, but that was not linear. So at all, right? exactly. So d of theta one plus i d theta two is d of theta one plus d of i d theta two. Good. Thank you. So d of theta one plus i d theta of i theta two is d theta one plus d i d theta two. And this is equal to d of theta 1 plus 1 over i d theta 2. So now there's only a factor of 2 which was a slight issue. And well, um, yeah, I'm not sure what to do about that. I think we can fix that also. But the sign got fixed. Can, can you see? Yeah. yeah. That, that's really correct. Okay, let me move on. I think many of these things will resolve themselves and of course I'll encourage you to do all the exercises that you can think of. They, many exercises will suggest themselves. And I should have put some in the notes, but so far I haven't done. So supposing I have now real, a larger space which with real anti numbers theta 1 up to theta n, that number of them, hmm, arbitrary number of them. Now, I can consider f of theta i, so it's like a multivariate function of multivariable function, and I'll get f0 uh, plus f1 comma i theta i. So the way to understand it is there are all the possible terms linear in all the theta i's. I think I put the index up. Just as I do with x, I'll do it with theta. So you see, this is a linear term, but for every theta i, the coefficient needs a label i. So I write f1 comma i, and then plus f1 uh, f2 comma ij theta i theta j, and then I can continue. Plus dot dot dot. But the interesting thing is that the last term f n will have i1 up to i n theta i1 up to theta i n. Then there can't be any more terms. Okay. But the beautiful thing is how many of these are there? Only one. How many of these are there? n. How many of these are there? n choose 2. Because theta i theta j is an anti-symmetric pair in i and j. Therefore, this is an anti-symmetric matrix in two variables. So there are n choose 2, then we get n choose 3, etc. And the last guy, there's only really one, one of them. So it's like a binomial expansion, 1, n, n choose 2, etc. 
So that is built into this Taylor, uh, Taylor series, which is a nice property. Sir, yes. So like when you were talking about Grassmann numbers, yeah. uh, you wrote like, like we had defined a space theta 1, 2, 3 time. Yeah. And you had written that any number can be written in this form. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So, okay, yeah, that makes sense. We are still in the same space. Yeah, we are in the same yeah, space. Yeah. And not only that, we can now see clearly that it's a generalization of our ordinary space because here I can put any standard number. So I can say a standard number is a number where f1, f2 up to fn are all zero. Yeah. Then it's just an ordinary number. I can even make it a function of x if I want additionally. Then this can be a function of x, this will be a function of x. These will all be functions of x. I could do that. Okay, so there are a lot of nice things you can do and formulae that come out naturally. But just now, I don't want to make this a function of x. So I shouldn't have done this. And now I want to ask the following question. If you remember, to get the path integral, we needed to do integrals of Gaussians. So now I want to do an integral of a Gaussian. So I want to do integral d theta 1 up to d theta n e to the minus half theta i operator, operate, just a matrix oij theta j, where the sum over i and j is implied. Okay, for x we have done this and we got det to the minus half of this thing o upon 2 pi and then we generalized that to the field case. First we generalized it to quantum mechanics, then we generalized it to the full field case. So what do we do with this? Well. Uh, it's a very cute result that this integral is equal to debt to the half of O if n is even and it's equal to 0 if n is odd. The total number of anti-commuting thetas if it's even or odd. So we can prove this, it will only take a minute. Uh, for the odd case, we first just consider n equals 1. Then obviously, there is nothing in the exponent because if there is only 1 theta, then this must be theta squared, but theta squared is 0. So there is nothing to integrate and in if you integrate over nothing, you get 0. So n equals 1, it is verified. This prediction is verified. Let us look at n equals even. Now notice that because this theta i and theta j anti-commute, O is anti-symmetric. Okay, so O is a real anti-symmetric matrix, and it's a theorem for matrices that a real anti-symmetric matrix can be brought. You see, an anti real anti-symmetric matrix actually has imaginary eigenvalues. Okay, so uh, that's that's not ideal. We want to keep it real. So what's the best we can do if we try to make it as diagonal as possible? We can't diagonalize it completely, okay? Um, but we can. What's the best form we can bring it into by some similarity transformation? Uh, and the answer is we can bring it to this form. Uh, we can block diagonalize it in two by two blocks. I hope you can see how this generalizes. Hmm? And this works for even n. It's also true for odd n, except that then there's one block left over, which can't be 2 by 2, in the, and that entry is 0. So it's also a theorem that every anti-symmetric matrix uh, of odd uh, dimension has uh, at least one 0 eigenvalue. Okay, all these things are very easy to prove in matrix algebra. If you are not try to prove it or if you are not sure, then please look it up. Hmm? So every such matrix can be brought to this form. Very good. Now given this, um, Sir, yes. O consists of, the operator consists of commuting numbers. Right? Yes. Yes. Because these are anti-commuting. Together they are commuting. So we will put a commuting O here. Here is not even an operator, it is just a matrix, ordinary numerical matrix. Later it would be an operator. Okay, so 
to prove this relation, we need to evaluate the left side and the right side. So first let me evaluate the right side of this relation. Okay. Given that form, we see that debt of O is equal to A12 squared A34 squared dot 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 An minus 1 N squared. Because it's the product of determinants of each 2 by 2 block, which is precisely A12 squared, A34 squared, and so on. Okay. Uh, for n even and debt of O is 0 for n odd. Okay. So therefore, I can put a root here and then I can remove all these squares. Though there is a small subtlety which is that there is a plus, and minus, plus or minus and one thing you'll see when it comes to these fermionic or Grassmann anti-commuting numbers, there are lots of plus and minus ambiguities. And it turns out that some of them actually have important impact in field theory. So we'll just remember in our minds that there was a plus and minus in taking this square root. Okay, so that's the right side of this. So now what about the left side? Well, for the left side, what we'll do is to expand it factor by factor. Ah, now again I have a half issue and I'm not sure what I've done. Yeah. Ah, good, good, I don't have any half. Very good. <coughs> now let's look at the left side. So for the left side, this is our right hand side. Okay, now let's look at the left side. Now, if I put this into that form, then I'll see that this breaks up into pairs. There's d theta 1, d theta 2, e to the minus. Now, I have to take minus half theta 1, O 1, 2, theta 2, and also theta 2, O 2, 1, theta 1, and both are the same because of anti-commutation. So, the half goes. So I get e to the minus a12 theta1 theta2. And then d theta3, d theta4, e to the minus a34 theta3 theta4, and so on dot dot dot. And because there's one unpaired guy, if n is odd, then at the end there'll be d theta n with nothing to integrate it over and that's going to make it zero. So that confirms the rest of my prediction. But as far as the first part of this, so let me evaluate one of these. So I expand this exponential. It's a function after all and I can expand it with its Taylor series. And what is its Taylor series? Well, it's very simple. This function exponential is the same as one minus a12 theta1 theta2. And that's the end of it. Because the square of this quantity is again 0. Okay. So, and d theta 1, d theta 2 integrating 1, that gives me 0 by my rules. So, I have minus. Now, a12 is a commuting number. It comes out. So, I get a12 d theta 1, d theta 2, theta 1, theta 2. Okay. Now, in order to use my integration rules, theta 1 has to come and sit next to d theta 1. So, it has to hop here. That's a minus sign. Then d theta 1, theta 1 is 1. d theta 2, theta 2 is also 1. And so, I get plus a 1, 2. And that's the end of my proof. So, the LHS is a 1, 2, a 3, 4, dot, 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 a L minus 1, N. <coughs> it's very nice. And it actually reproduces some cool features of determinants of antisymmetric matrices which have been known in mathematics for a long time. So one of the things that's known about antisymmetric matrices is that their determinant, if they are even dimensional, their determinant is always a perfect square because of the fact that you get it in this form. So we got everything twice. Okay, That means the determinant admits a natural square root which is called the permanent. So if you look in the old math literature, determinants of anti-symmetric matrices can be square rooted easily to find what is called the permanent of the matrix, which is just this quantity. Okay. And there are also ways, nice ways to write it without going to this basis, this special basis. <coughs>
but the special basis will be enough for us. So, conclusion is that the determinant of a Gaussian or is the, the integral over a Gaussian is debt to the plus half. Now, notice it's exactly the opposite of bosons which gave me debt to the minus half, which is giving me debt to the plus half. So, that's a striking result. And again, I emphasize it's absolutely true. When you actually calculate this debt in field theory, it will give you some physical property for fermion path integrals and the fact that it's plus half and not minus half will give you certain Feynman rules which are exactly the right ones to get correct scattering amplitudes and it's one of the reasons why electron scattering amplitudes will be different from say Higgs particle scattering amplitudes because one was a, a boson, one was a fermion. <coughs> so it really does work. Okay, a small exercise in the complex case we have integral dz, d, dz i, dz i bar e to the minus z bar i o i j z i. Uh, if you, j, if you do this in ordinary uh, Gaussian integration, so z's are complex numbers, then you get debt inverse, no, not debt to the minus half, but debt to the minus one. Basically, it incorporates the fact that every complex number contains two real numbers, x and y. Okay. And if you do this for complex thetas, then d theta i d theta dagger i e to the minus theta dagger i o i j theta j will be there to the plus one of o. In this case, o will not be anti-symmetric because theta dagger and theta, they are different objects. So, they, they, they don't make this o anti-symmetric. So, it's neither symmetric nor anti-symmetric, but it is Hermitian. And uh, here also, uh, it's Hermitian, and you'll be able to find, uh, or maybe this is anti-Hermitian, I forget, but anyway, you'll find these results. Hmm? So, uh, this is just the square of the previous ones, and you can do it by breaking the complex ones into real and imaginary parts. So, it should be anti-Hermitian. Probably anti-Hermitian, yeah. Uh, well, no, let's see, theta dagger, yeah, let me not try to figure that out here. You, you work this out, it's very easy exercise. Yeah, I think it's anti -hermitian. Okay, now <coughs> we are out of time, but there's a lot to be done. Uh, for, so this completes part one of the three stage process. So I'll start on part two now, just for five minutes, and we'll continue it and complete it hopefully tomorrow. So in part two, we have to consider fermion. I'm going to put it in quotes, fermion quantum mechanics. Now, <coughs> it's not exactly what you would think that you learned in your, or what you learned in your previous quantum mechanics courses, which are quantum mechanics of a particle which has a coordinate in space, but it also happens to be a fermion. Here, by this I mean a, the quantum mechanics of a particle whose coordinate is an anti-commuting number, psi of t. And what's my motivation? That eventually, uh, when we restore the x dependence, it will turn into the Dirac field psi of t and x, which we already have argued must be an anti-commuting valued number. Okay. So by ignoring x, we basically have only as much complication as ordinary quantum mechanics rather than field theory. So we are going to consider that case. And the way we'll start is that <coughs> we can certainly canonically quantize this just as we do for the Dirac field, but simpler by introducing operators psi of t and psi dagger of t and requiring the anti-commutator to be one. In Dirac theory, we require it to be delta 3 of x minus x prime, but since all x dependence is removed, x is already equal to x prime, and we simply don't put a delta function. Okay, so it's just one. We could have put an h bar, but uh, we have set h bar equals 1 for this part of the course, so it's 1. You may wonder why there isn't an i. Actually, it's because psi dag i psi dagger will be the momentum canonically <coughs> conjugate to psi. So when I remove the i, it drops from the other side. And this is the standard fermion anti-commutation relation together with psi, psi equals 0 
people, psi dagger, psi dagger. This is nothing but what you've already learnt in QFT1 with the x-dependence thrown away by hand. Okay. Now what we want to calculate is the propagator analog for a configuration of psi of t which ends with the anti-commuting value psi n dagger at time t n and starts with the anti-commuting value psi 0 at time to uh, t0. <clears throat> so Okay. And this we are going to define by taking the analog of position eigenstate, but position in the anti-commuting sense, e to the minus i Hamiltonian t, and position eigenstate here, and t. <coughs> yes? So, is there any motivation why it should land at psi and dagger and not psi and yeah, actually uh, there is, <coughs> and it, I didn't do the case of a complex uh, particle, a particle moving in a plane, but it would have been the same. So the if psi, so when psi acts on that side, it behaves as if it's psi dagger when acting on this side. It's uh, just the standard fact that bras and ketz involve a complex conjugation between them. So in that case, would that be a psi n plane or I'll, still psi n No, so. I'll, I'll define this. Psi n dagger Tn is defined to be the bra corresponding to psi n Tn. This is the ket, this is the ket psi 0 T0. So there's similarly a ket psi n Tn. If I dagger it, I get this because the eigenvalue, remember these are like analog of position eigenstates. So psi 0 would be the eigenvalue of the operator. Okay, and that eigenvalue being a, will be a complex anti-commuting number, so the eigenvalue on this side will be the complex conjugate anti-commuting. Okay, and uh, it will turn out actually it's very easy to construct these, uh, and we'll do that. Uh, I'm also going to put a normalization because in principle for this we should have normalized these to one, but it will be more convenient to leave them with some natural normalization which we'll find and we'll put this to bring the normalization back to 1. So n will be a product of the normalization for that and the normalization for that. Okay. <clears throat> and what are these states defined by? The position eigenstate in anti-commuting space is a ket psi 0 t 0 such that if the operator psi acts on it, it gives me the eigenvalue psi 0. Okay. I think I've really run out of time, so I should stop. Uh, you may find it awkward because I already said there are no standard Grassmann numbers that we can sort of conceptualize. So what is psi 0? It's quite abstract. For the same reason, this path if you like, where something starts at the value psi 0 and ends at a different value psi n is also very abstract. But fortunately, there's a nice way out of that. The nice way, if you remember, with uh, ordinary quantum mechanics, our particle started at xi and ended at xf. But then we took a classical solution which has that property and the fluctuation then started and ended at 0. Hmm. We'll do something similar here. Uh, with the difference that actually with fermions, we don't really have non-trivial classical solutions. So the only sensible classical solutions we consider with these kind of variables are psi equals zero itself. That will already be a classical solution. And that of course starts at zero and ends at zero. Okay, And therefore, <coughs> everything we do in the fermionic case will be as if we were dealing directly with the fluctuation. So this is a very important difference between bosons and fermions. With bosons, I can have a condensate, which is the, the meaning of classical solution in field theory. With fermions, I can't. Okay. So with fermions, it's actually simpler. I don't have to worry about psi 0 and psi n. So just for, for sake of formalism, I'm going to keep them till I derive the path integral. But in all practical applications, we can just forget about psi 0 and psi n. 
okay so the only grassmann numbers that will arise at the end are the ones which are under the integral sign those of course have to be there so that we can get a path integral and then that path integral will tell us how to calculate amplitudes in field theory sir yes uh, so when you say psi is zero hmm. like that and also the fact that integral d theta was uh, defined to be zero yes uh, does that mean that zero also forms like is part of the yeah. uh, maybe i shouldn't have said psi is zero um i guess what i really meant to say was that psi starts and ends with the same you know when we calculate for example a partition function then it starts and ends at the same value and we integrate over it mm. so that will be one application we'll put psi 0 and psi n equal and integrate over the common value that's allowed another is to take this t to be an infinite duration which is what we do for scattering experiments and in that case the starting and ending really won't matter because the whatever you however you start or end this thing in practice the whole theory will go into its vacuum state in the far past and far future it just gets projected onto vacuum state so hold off on that and you'll, you'll see how it works i'll keep boundary terms only for the one more lecture and then i think we'll be dropping all the boundary terms <laughs>